Okay. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session with Education USA. We today have a very, very, very important topic to speak about. And we have two very special guests to help us conduct this session. Um, today, we are talking about liberal arts colleges and research universities or public universities, the education system in the USA, how different um, education systems are over there. However, how similar they are in the quality as well. Today, we have Mr. Ahmed Abdurrahman, who is the Assistant Director for International Recruitment at Maryville College. Hello, Ahmed. Hi. Happy to have you. Hi, everyone. And we have with us Ms. Stephanie C. Green. Am I pronouncing the last name correctly? Please say that I am. That is perfect. Thank you. Really? Um, Ms. Seagreen is the um, Director for International Recruitment at University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And they will be helping us today with, or they will be actually conducting the session uh, for you. And we will be receiving questions towards the end. For those of you who do not know uh, Education USA or are not familiar with our work, uh, I would like to give a quick briefing to um, those and tell you who we are. احنا بكل بساطة احنا شبكة تعليمية أو شبكة مستشارين تعليميين موجودين في العالم كله. نشتغل تبع وزارة الخارجية الأمريكية من خلال مؤسسة أمريس هنا في مصر. موجودين في كذا مكان. في العالم في حوالي 470 مدينة منهم اثنين هنا في مصر شغالين في القاهرة في أمد إيست في الدقي في اسكندرية في أمد إيست برضو هناك ودلوقتي بقالنا حوالي احنا دلوقتي في أغسطس بقالنا حوالي خمس شهور شغالين virtual which is helping us to reach a broader um, audience uh, علشان نقدر نوصل لكم في أماكن من مصر ممكن تكون صعبة أنها تقدر تحضر الساشز بتاعتنا اللي كانت موجودة في المقر بتاعنا اللي احنا بنعمله ان احنا طول السنة بنتكلم على ال education system in USA trying to help you regarding anything uh, related to higher education in USA so we work with you regarding choosing your best fit universities how to find the best financing options uh, for your studies how to complete your university application as well and this is like the biggest bulk of work that we have because we have work on the personal essays, recommendation letters, standardized testing, and stuff like that. So today, the topic will be simply uh, liberal arts colleges and research universities, the differences and similarities between them. I will leave the mic to my colleagues who are thankfully with us today to assist us. Thank you guys for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Walid. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Pleasure is all ours. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm kind of confused right now, whether between Arabic and English. I, I, I want, I'm originally from Cairo, Egypt, but I have lived in the United States for um, over 23 years. So now being like talking to an audience from Egypt uh, makes me want to switch to Arabic and then switch back to English. You can be as I'll... playful as you want. I know that. <laughs> no, I'll try my best to stick to English. Have an issue with that, but mainly we're going for English, of course, to have everybody involved. I know that anybody who's interested in studying in the USA will definitely have a certain level of comprehension in English that will allow them to understand. But whenever you would like to feel comfortable wearing your old shoes, that is definitely acceptable. Go ahead. Definitely. Um, Stephanie, do you want to? Well, my apologies for my Arabic. I don't even speak <laughs> Shweya, so <laughs> I might could do the translations, but um, thank you so much for allowing us to present to you all today. We're, we're looking forward to providing more of a general overview about US education and how to navigate trying to find the right institution that would be best for you. As Waleed had mentioned, whether it's a cost factor, trying to find scholarships, is, which is the right academic program, hopefully we'll provide this in more of a broad sense, but also give you the tools to help narrow it down during your search to make it a little bit easier. 
and working with the Education USA team. So without further ado, uh, Ahmed, would you like to kick it off? Definitely. Uh, can you, I, I really hope that you all can see the presentation that I'm sharing right now. So, <laughs> um, so as Stephanie said, we're going to uh, talk in general about navigating the U.S. education options, but then we're going to give that um, through the perspectives of the two uh, types of institutions that we represent, liberal arts colleges and research-oriented universities. Um, let's hope the technology uh, uh, cooperates. So this is me and Stephanie. <laughs> I'm the Assistant Director of International Admissions and Recruitment at Maryville College uh, in Maryville, Tennessee. And uh, Stephanie is the Director of International Recruitment at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, like we said, we are going to um, give you an overview about the roadmap to studying in the US and uh, Education US, USA is one of those um, invaluable resources in your search. Um, Walid uh, kindly introduced, of course, the, the services that they do. Uh, this graphic is from uh, uh, Education USA, uh, and it lays out the five different steps, the roadmap to studying in the US. Uh, of course, due to the limited time we are not going to be able to go over all five steps but we are going to mainly focus on the first step researching your options and finding your best fit and we may touch on the the second step as well uh, about financing your studies um, so in this presentation the first thing that we are, we are going to be covering six different um, points First, the different types of higher education institutions, just to lay out the, the, the ground for that. And then we are going to um, talk about those criteria that should um, direct your, your search. Uh, academic considerations, uh, programs of study, uh, whether uh, the campus life, if this is something that you are interested in. Um, value and affordability is a big point. Um, again, finding your personal fit. And then at the end, we are going to put it all together and give the examples uh, directly from our institutions. Stephanie, do you want to add anything? Sure. No, I think going into the next slide will give a, a visual of where to start. And many of you have already have probably started your investigation of which institution may be of interest. You probably already know some key names of schools, University of California, Berkeley, um, University of Massachusetts, um, Texas. There's a number of different institutions to choose from. So how do you find out which one might be the right one for you versus just what you might have heard about on TV or through other resources or contacts? So to start from a larger standpoint, we thought that it would be good for to share with you, and you may already know this, we should have added as a trivia question, but there are currently over 4,000 U.S. higher education institutions to, for you to choose from. Now, these are all institutions that are accredited that would transfer to other countries abroad, and Ahmed will get into the specifics about accreditation here in a few minutes, but 4,000 institutions is quite a, a large number for you to have to go through to find out which one is that perfect one for me. And it doesn't always have to be the, the large name that everybody knows about globally. It could be that smaller institution that has just the right fit for you. And hopefully, you know, as we go through this presentation, we'll be able to fine tune and help you to navigate these waters. So 4,000, hopefully we can narrow that down to at least about 10 or so for you. Yes. And uh, we should probably start by attracting your attention that, uh, to those two terms, college and university. Actually, in the United States, there are three. So generally, you can represent, uh, refer to a higher uh, education institution by school or by a college or as a university. And all three terms, school, college, university, can be used interchangeably. 
Uh, this sometimes creates some confusion uh, abroad outside of the United States because the term college may refer, for example, uh, abroad to a high school or may, may refer to, uh, when you think about it, you might just think it is a community college. Uh, but actually, college uni and university can be for your uh, four-year university, and they can offer uh, bachelor's degrees as well as a master's or a PhD. Uh, so that's, I wanted to start with this um, just to attract your attention to the, the interchangeability of those terms. Um, we are going to start with giving the overview of the types of school. 4,000 4, options is uh, a daunting task to navigate through. Uh, so depending on what you are looking for, where you are in your search, did you, are you currently in high school? Did you graduate high school? Are you looking for an undergraduate to, to, to earn a bachelor's degree? Or did you already start college or the university in your home country in Egypt and you are looking for pursuing um, a master's degree or a PhD? Are you looking to um, earn a professional degree uh, such as law school, going to law school or med school or pharmacy? So, as you can see, there, there are three main uh, types of, of, of schools in the United States, undergraduate level, professional degrees, and then graduate degrees. In this presentation, again, for the sake of time, we are only going to focus on the undergraduate. And as you can see, the undergraduate is not a small, focusing on that is not a small task. I mean, you've got two-year associate degrees at, at the community colleges. You've got bachelor's degrees at colleges and universities. Um, there is a difference between public and private, and even private can be nonprofit or for-profit, uh, liberal arts colleges and universities versus research universities. There, is, uh, there are lots and lots of options to navigate through. And hopefully, by the end of this presentation, we would have given you at least food for thought, navigated you, uh, helped you start your journey. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, did you want to add something? Sure. I think from the beautiful diagram that Ahmed had put together for you all, I think this is the internal uh, professor in Ahmed that he's done the homework for you to at least <laughs> help navigate and outline what the infrastructure looks like in terms of higher education options and it seems complex, but it, it really isn't. And especially if we're focusing in on undergraduate degrees or bachelor's degrees, this will be a good start for you to understand what's the difference between, or how the US defines public, private, four year, two year, and even the notion of what community colleges are. So I think that would take us into the next slide about community colleges. This is a bit of an anomaly for many places outside of the US. It's growing in interest, not only within the US, but also abroad, that is becoming more and more of an interest, primarily because most of these organizations or these types of schools provide the same level of academic excellence, especially if they're accredited, as a four-year public or private institution. So it's something you, you would not want to dismiss when you're reviewing if, if cost is a factor, because you can get a great foundation for two years at a community college and transfer to a four-year institution at a fraction of the cost. Especially if the institution you're looking at provides very little in scholarship opportunities, this would be a great way to, to save that. And also, if it is accredited, they would be or would have the availability of being transferable. Within the state of Tennessee, for example, we have a statewide agreement that any community college within the state, as long as you receive an Associates of Science, for example, it would automatically transfer to the four-year institution, making it very easy for those that want to, to transfer. So they are accredited, just like a four-year institution. Typically, it's because it's a smaller institution, it's a fraction of the cost. So hopefully that will give you at least a, a good idea or a starting point if you're interested in looking at community colleges 
which I know Education USA will be happy to provide further information on these resources as well. Yeah, and uh, you might not, uh, actually, if you started your journey at a community college, you, like Stephanie said, you might, because of the transfer pathways, you might not even lose any time. Um, they tend to be not residential, so you're gonna have to find your own housing. Uh, but again, the tuition cost is, um, is much lower. Um, this brings us to the main focus of our presentation, uh, the liberal arts and uh, colleges and universities, and then followed by the uh, research-based universities. So for uh, liberal arts uh, colleges and universities, they offer bachelor's degrees of arts and sciences, so uh, based on the name, you might be uh, inclined to think that liberal arts, that means it's just arts, music, uh, uh, drawing, painting, and so on. Uh, uh, actually, the term liberal arts is more to be understood as liberating the mind. It's more focusing on uh, critical thinking, on um, uh, having the students and the graduates ask the right questions, uh, be curious, um, um, anal analytical thinking and uh, communicating. So that's where this liberal arts um, term comes from. So again, they offer bachelor's degrees of arts or sciences. They are uh, well known for the social sciences and the arts as well as the STEM fields. So. It is not uncommon to find uh, liberal arts colleges that excel in engineering, in biology, pre-med, pre-professional uh, degrees, so pre-med, pre-pharmacy, as well as um, other professional degrees like pre-law or business degrees. Um, so again, liberating the mind to think creatively and critically. And one of the main things that differentiate liberal arts colleges from other uh, universities or other types of universities is that um, the core curriculum, the broader range of study. So uh, there is also a strong interdisciplinary foundation. Um, so they offer that foundation in humanities, social sciences, mathematics, and sciences. Um, so a variety of subjects in addition to the specific field of study. Many of the liberal arts uh, colleges and universities, liberal arts education in general, um, offer this excellent foundation for graduate and professional studies. Uh, because of the transferability of skills that they acquire and their ability for, for our graduates, for the graduates of liberal arts, their ability to adapt um, and transition from one job to the next to even be prepared for the jobs that have not been created yet. They are very well suited for starting a career if they want to, or based on the research and based on the thinking and the critical thinking and the foundation, then they can also be prepared, well prepared for uh, graduate school. So we like to, to say that liberal arts education prepares engineers that can do a presentation, uh, doctors that can communicate and understand the, the, their clients, their, their, the, the psyche of their clients. They can um, innovate. They are open to all these um, variety of innovation, critical thinking. Um, so liberal arts colleges, I mean, they also have the reputation of being just private, um, but this is a misconception. There are private, mostly private, uh, but there are public institutions as well that are liberal arts. Uh, what is the difference between public and private? So public, it, it, mainly it is the funding. Mainly it is the source of funding. Public are funded by the state, uh, by the government, while private is uh, dependent on um, donation and, uh, 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 you know, uh, 
uh, like the alumni, the, the, the tuition, of course, and fees. And that's why they might, may tend to be tuition wise, they may tend to be higher than public institutions. But that's another misconception that we are going to uh, go over and try to uh, make it clearer throughout the presentation. Um, they tend to be smaller liberal arts institutions or colleges or universities. So they pride themselves on providing strong student support, the sense of community. Uh, when you have only um, less than 3,000 or 4,000 students on campus, um, you get that sense of community. Do uh, You get the strong student support. Um, that doesn't say, that doesn't mean that other universities and research universities would not be providing the same. It's just the focus for liberal arts because of the size, the small class sizes would be um, more accessible, those that the students support. Um, I don't want to go on and on, but as you can see from the pictures, for example, they, they focus on sciences as well as the arts, whether it's um, theater, music, uh, chorus, and so on. And with this, I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie, and she can tell us more about the research-based universities. One, I know we were mentioning that this is a four-year university. I think to keep in mind Ideally, students would want to complete their undergraduate degree in four years, but sometimes it might take an extra year. Um, this is where part of your research, when you look at the specific academic programs that you're interested in, you want to make sure that you're looking at all the courses that are required for degree completion, because there might be other opportunities to add on a minor or another type of degree that will add possibly some time, but that would be something for you to discuss during your, um, your academic advising sessions to see how long this may take you to complete your degree. So we use that loosely in terms of, of four year where sometimes it may take six, but most of the time it does take about four years to complete an undergraduate degree. And as Ahmed was saying, private, public, universities could be the same, same instance in terms of public funding or private funding from endowments. And then from the public, you also have what we call flagship institutions and land grant. And I, I do understand that this is sometimes used most of the time within the U.S. versus internationally. And what that means is that each state within the U.S. has funding from their government to help within the state, to help give back education, research, whatever it might be in terms of economic development. So that's why many institutions institutions may have that terminology added at their flagship or land grant. It's typically because their local government is providing them additional funding sources to conduct research per se. And for many universities, they do have research institutions, but they may not, not all of them would be research based as well. That's something to keep in mind. They will say a research one, there's a research two, that matters in terms of the level of research dedication. And we'll talk a little bit more about the levels of, of research in, in a little bit as well. So public, private, large, small, and many will think, you know, a four-year institution within the states, as this one picture will indicate, which holds over 100,000 people watching an American football game, that's not necessarily the size of how many students attend the institution. For example, for Tennessee, we have about 28,000. That's both undergraduate and postgraduate students attending. So universities can range from 1,000 students attending or even a few hundred up to 60,000 and plus. It just varies on the institution and where it may be regionally. Yeah, and, and again, so the public versus private, the large versus small, um, the research versus the research based versus just research incorporated into the curriculum, all these are factors for you to consider. Uh, that doesn't, uh, like research, for example, having a research-based institution, it helps in the, at least in the graduate level, but also the faculty that are engaged in research can help at the undergraduate level. 
uh, that doesn't mean that public that private uh, liberal arts institutions or smaller universities would not also offer their undergraduate research opportunities and hands-on experience it it um, this again depends on what you are looking for, what field of study you are looking for, and uh, where you are looking at the university. Um, so, as we said, there are a lot of factors, a lot of options for you in the United States to study uh, at a different level, and we already covered the different types of schools, uh, gave the overview of this. In the rest of the presentation, throughout the rest of the presentation, we are going to try to help you navigate through your options to find your best fit. Um, and as you can see from this uh, chart, ranking versus accreditation. I know that this is a big question that uh, um, uh, affects uh, a lot of you uh, who are looking for a program or a university in the United States. We are going to focus on the different kinds of programs of study. Why, why does it matter? Does this matter to you? Uh, value and affordability, uh, whether um, uh, it is a, um, a must-have criteria or just a desirable but optional criteria. So there are things that uh, must have, that means it's, it can, it's make it or break it. Uh, if you don't have this program that you want to study, at a university, why would you go there? Uh, but uh, let's say um, you don't like the cold, or you don't like the heat, or the, the, the rain, or these are preferences that you can live with. So we're going to navigate um, through these options and um, help you also weigh whether this is a make it or break it criteria for you. Um, and let me start by this ranking versus accreditation. Um, a lot of students um, and a lot of families even are uh, what we call brand oriented. Um, I, I'm posing, I'm going to pose this question. Of course, I can't hear you answer it. But what, what, what do you think is better? What do you think is more um, valuable, is more important? ranking or accreditation um, and this is rhetorical so I'm going to answer it for you so accreditation is more important accreditation is um, an objective um, uh, objective evaluation of the institution and actually it's voluntary so an institution goes through an accreditation process it's a lengthy uh, costly uh, process to be reviewed and evaluated against strict standards and, and processes for quality control. So when an institution is accredited, that means it went through all this. It has been vetted. It has been deemed to be providing quality education. So now, what about ranking? Ranking is not, a, is not, I mean, I'm not saying do not even consider ranking, but ranking approach this with no, the knowledge that ranking is more subjective. It's uh, more based on polls and surveys, what students feel, what, um, uh, and you are, and, and it's, it's mainly, um, it can be, by for-profit, done by for-profit organizations or entities, that, that means you can buy the ranking. <laughs> you, can, you can pay to be uh, reviewed and so on. So that doesn't mean it's not important. It can give you a different aspect, a different uh, perspective about a university, but accreditation is more important. Being an accredited institution is more important and pay attention being accredited or accreditation organizations are not created equal so even within the accreditation entities or organizations they need to be recognized they need to be recognized by higher authorities such as the council for higher education 
this is an authority that reviews the processes that accrediting agencies go through and, and, and do. Uh, the, department, the, the US Department of Ed does the same thing. So regionally accredited institution is the best, is going to be the best uh, option for you, is the institution that has been vetted for quality. And there are six, seven, seven entities, seven regional, regional accreditation institution, um, organizations which means if you go to SACS, for example, for example, this is for the South. So if you look at a university that's in the Midwest or in the North, you're not going to find it accredited by SACS. So where do you go? I mean, do you really uh, do you conclude right away that this university is not accredited? No. Each accrediting agency, regional, will just accredit their universities. So where to go to find any accredited institution? You will go to CHEA, or C-H-E-A, Council for Higher Education Accreditation. Here, you can find any institution in the United States, and whether it is accredited by a recognized accreditation agency, by the Council for, for Higher Education, or by the US Department of Ed, or by both. Okay, and I think if you have any questions about this at the end of the presentation, we can go over more of this. But at least this is give this gives you an idea about the difference between the two. I think just to add to about ranking, if that is something of importance to you, and and maybe for looking at academic programs in particular, if you're looking at the institution overall, they have that type of ranking, and then they have the academic units that are ranked as well. That holds more weight than maybe an overall institution because I know some schools will be ranked fifth in the nation for being the most beautiful campus. Yes. Um, and if you want to go to the most beautiful campus, that's great. You know, there's a ranking for that, but there's also rankings that are probably have more weight. And for you, when you look career wise, someone that has a higher ranking for their academic program but also is coming from an accredited institution. So looking at the both. The other item is if you are working for a government entity moving forward, you wanna make sure that you are coming from an accredited institution if you're wanting to carry that degree for a postgraduate in another country, whether it's in Egypt or elsewhere, they will look at the certification of accreditation. And most institutions who are accredited, accredited will have it on their main website for you to easily find you know who their accrediting body is yeah but but again pay attention to who the accrediting body is so again recognized accreditation agencies are the ones that you want to look at uh, because again uh, there are a lot of accreditation agencies that are not recognized by those that uh, the u.s department of ed but then they will present themselves as accredited institution. So exactly. Good point. Ah, oh, the fun part, the academic consideration. So you're going on to university or, or college, whether it's liberal art or even a, a public research institution, the main factor typically is what type of academics you want to go into. It doesn't always have to be. And another unique fact or focus for U.S. institutions, especially with liberal art colleges, is that you can explore your options within your first two years. This is some good thing to keep in mind. Even at some research institutions, they will allow you to do an exploratory option. Um, and what we have set up within, within the U.S. education structure is general education. Almost 99% of U.S. institutions will require you to take at least two years of general education. This consists of communications, sciences, possibly a foreign language. As Ahmed was saying earlier with liberal arts, the US education system wants you to be a well-rounded individual. You will have great skills within the area of focus that you're researching or your core discipline, but they also want you to be prepared to manage people. You might have business courses, finances, this is all part of general education. So if you're not 
quite sure what you want to focus in, you could do the exploratory route. Um, some institutions allow this, not all of them, but that's just part of that fun exploratory option that you can do. And then also you have specialization. Some colleges or universities will allow you to go right into your core discipline. And that typically is more with your research institutions, but again, you would be required to do general education with some of those general education courses related to your um, specialized field. Others of specialization could be the arts. There are a number of undergraduate and postgraduate art school. So if you do enjoy um, pottery, for example, or arts, there's SCAD, which is within Savannah, Georgia, and other parts of the US. They are specialized within that particular field or, or full sale which does media and works directly with Disney, for example. They have many of the individuals that attend those institutions will go on to be creative designers for Disney, for example. So if, you're look, if you know specifically where you want to end up career-wise, there are institutions that are set up specific to that. And Education USA is going to be a great resource to explore those options. The other item to keep in mind when you're looking at the different schools with the academic side is which programs offer internships or even career, um, what we call co-op is a term that we have here. It's similar to internships or they're sometimes interchangeably used. Now, if they have it as part of your career, you're able to do work or research within that particular discipline that you've chosen whether it's on campus because there are limitations for students that are coming from another country to study within the US. Typically, you can only work on campus, but if it's part of your discipline and you're getting a, a credit towards that, you'd be able to apply that or find a position at a place outside of campus for additional experience to add to your CV. So that would be a great thing, especially within engineering to be looking for if they have that as part of their discipline. If not, it's okay, but it's something that will give you more experience and also to develop your CV even more, as, as just mentioned. So the other item for is research. Which ones are you able to apply research at an undergraduate level? Not all institutions do have this. This is where, if you're looking at an, this is very important to you to incorporate research, especially earlier on during an undergraduate degree you may want to look at research one, even research two type of schools, because this is where you're able to fully integrate your core curriculum and have research under a faculty member that might have received a grant from an international source, a local source. Um, you can help co-publish papers. The, it just extends far beyond that you can imagine. For example, University of Tennessee works directly with the U.S. Department of Energy. We have a cooperation with Oak Ridge National Laboratories, which you may or may not be familiar with, but it does house the largest and the fastest computer in the world. Who would have thought in Knoxville, Tennessee would have the largest and fastest computer in the world? But we do have a partnership with them and part of the research component with your core curriculum. And if you're doing computer science, for example, possibly, computer engineering, even aerospace, you may be able to have that research opportunity with an establishment such as that. So those are some things you want to look at and also the faculty background. Where are the, where are the faculty coming from? What kind of research have they done in the past or what are they currently working on that you could be a part of as well? And some student testimonials. Many universities will post student testimonials about their experience with each of those academic programs. If they don't, and this is a school that you're interested, see I'm using school, college, university, using these interchangeably, you can reach out to those schools and ask them to maybe connect you with a current student within those programs to find out more. It would just be a recommendation. Definitely, and if I may add, um, so most, if not all of these options will be applicable to the, the full range of universities and colleges. So the general education, like Stephanie uh, mentioned, even university, research-based uni based universities would um, may require a certain uh, number of uh, semesters or number of years of, of general education. 
in liberal arts college colleges that is the same that is actually the core throughout i mean you've got um the, the broader knowledge versus and along with the specialization um one thing that i wanted to mention here and it's not really just related to your option while you are not you may not be required to declare a major until well until you explore your options before you come to the united states you should have a very solid idea about what is it that you want to study um, and this is for two things. First, you don't want to, you really want to know what you want to do um, if you are going to be traveling all the way to the United States and paying all this money. But the second and more important probably is that you're not going to get the visa, the student visa, if you don't know what is it that you want to study. If you cannot convince the um, uh, interviewer that what is it that you want to do, why do you want to go to study in the United States? Why do you want to study at this particular university? Why do you want to study this particular program? If you don't have a clear plan, you're not going to get the visa. <laughs> so, so that's one thing, even though you have your options and you can change, this is the beautiful thing. You can change your mind once, once you're here, once you explore, but you still need to have a solid idea about what is it that you want to do. Same thing with the career services and the internships. Um, at varying levels, almost every university or college will offer um, their students the opportunities. So again, this is something that um, I, I, I want to also mention here. There are things that you um, can find out about the particular university or college that you want through their website. If you can't find this information, then you reach out to them. Then you reach out to the admissions officer and say, okay, what kind of internships opportunities do you offer? Um, then um, what about research? I'm looking forward to uh, continuing on after the undergraduate to a graduate degree program. Um, how do you prepare me? How do you prepare me for, for graduate school? How do you prepare me if I wanted to stop and find a career right after graduation? How do you prepare me for that? And these are, and, uh, here, this is again, um, whether it's a college, a university, a liberal arts, a research, they exist. All these options exist, but you need to find out which, um, speaks to you and would be more beneficial in your field. Ooh, the fun part. Yes. <laughs> Value and affordability. Okay. We have to think of this as an investment. This is an investment in your, your future. When you look at the cost of attending a U.S. institution, what will that provide you long-term in terms of a career and also just for your own happiness? And when you're comparing the cost of different institutions, whether it's a community college, a private, a public, you know, the, the term we use, a flagship research institution, you always want to look at their cost of attendance. Now, even for us, when we go out and we research at various US institutions, they have it all in different places. But if you can ask specifically about the cost of attendance, not just don't ask, how much does it cost to attend there? Because they might just give you the tuition, possibly some fees, but you wanna have a full clear picture of one, how much is it for tuition per term or year? How much is it going to cost for me to live there? Um, how much is it typically to live on campus or live off of campus in the area? Because that could be different for the two. Also, what should I expect to pay for in groceries or going to the market, for example? How much is it for water, a bottle of water, or a bottle of milk, or something like that? Because that will help you to adjust your, also your lifestyle and what you're wanting to have within that region. And as you may know, the East Coast and the West Coast, for us in, within the U.S., those are your more expensive regions to live. Tuition could be lower, um, but you also need to look at housing, getting around, if you're driving a car, if you're having to take public transportation, these are all variables that can add up in terms of expenses. 
So cost of attendance is recommended to look at for every for your institutions that you may be deciding upon. That could have a factor for you. Scholarships as well. Now that we have competitive and they also have merit-based. The merit-based is typically all the information that you submit on your application form. That would be from your high school transcripts that they would review. It could be, you know, SAT or ACT that you might be taking or any other kind of um, national type of uh, test that you may have had. It could also be based on extracurricular. What have you been doing while you were in high school? Were you a part of playing the violin or our piano in an orchestra? Uh, because those could have factors in some scholarships. Every institution should have some website that's typically labeled financial aid or could be scholarships and financial aid are, are two most common and will list the different scholarships available to students. You may also want to put in there when you're searching specifically for international students because they could have different criteria or they could even have specific and special scholarships for students that might be coming from a different country outside of the U.S. And there are a number of institutions, for example, University of Nebraska has scholarships, I believe about five different ones for students that are coming from abroad and they have a different range of scholarship availability as well. So many of them will offer specific ones, but you always want to keep in mind the deadline and also if they have a separate scholarship application. They may or they may not. Um, for private institutions, as Ahmed had mentioned, you may be surprised. They might have a sticker price for tuition of $40,000 a year, but many times, and then talking to my dear friend Ahmed or other people within Tennessee at these private institutions, they're able to reduce that in scholarships and even bring it down to less cost, sometimes as a community college or even as for a public um, institution. So it's always good just to find out what's the overall cost of attendance and then part, of course, tuition, and then looking at the scholarship availability that you could apply for. Always do it early. For research institutions, they typically have a deadline date of November 1st, the year before you would be actually enrolling. So if you'd be enrolling for fall of 2021, the deadline would be coming up for November 1st, and this is very common for most larger public research institutions within the U.S. Very early deadline dates for not only application, but also for scholarships, just to keep in mind. Ahmed, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, uh, probably uh, this is one of the most important aspects in your search, um, um, because like the programs of study uh, that you are looking for, this can be a make it or break it. Uh, this can be um, something that you find a program that you like, you find your best fit, you find everything you are looking for, but it's it's too costly. It's it's uh, you cannot afford it. Um, and if you are uh, looking, starting your search uh, with with the full ride scholarship in mind. They, they exist, they, they, they do exist, but they are rare. They are not the, the common thing. So really, uh, unless you have uh, something very, very unique about you, that uh, the institution would really want you and have the financial ability to offer full ride scholarships, uh, you um, are going to rarely find a, re a full ride scholarship. Um, private versus public. Uh, I just want to reiterate um, what, what, uh, what Stephanie said. The sticker price might be $40,000 per year. And you might think that this, uh, while another university would have their tuition and fees as $25,000 per year. But the, 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 the $25,000 per year cost, the, they do not offer any scholarships, for example. So that is the out-of-pocket cost that you would be paying. While the $40,000 institution might have scholarships that would cover up to 
60% of that tuition, which makes it even cheaper than the other institution. So really, when you are comparing, compare apples to apples. Don't just look at the tuition and ignore the scholarships or don't look at the scholarships. Oh, they offer 60% tuition uh, discount scholarships, but then the sticker price is $50,000. Then you, again, you need to pay attention to that. Um, don't get just focused on one thing and ignore the other one. Um, the scholarships, so like Stephanie said, there are merit scholarships, but some institutions also offer need-based scholarships. Not all institutions can do that, but ask. And of course, uh, this information should be in a place on, their, on the institution's website where you can see where you can find, you don't have, you shouldn't be digging and digging and digging and it's buried somewhere other, uh, unless there is something to hide. So most institutions are going to be displaying that. Most ins institutions are going to be talking about the cost, making it very clear what the scholarships amount are, what the criteria are. And for international students, it makes, a huge difference. What is it, the I-20 cost, the, the form I-20, the out-of-pocket cost after the, all the scholarships that you are offered and some institutions may offer more than one scholarship that you can add together, which they call stacking them. So it, you may have a merit scholarship and a competitive scholarship added together. So ask about these things if you cannot find them easily. And if you can't find them easily, also think about why can I not find them easily? I think just to add, and we're gonna go into the next slide regarding the cost and also scholarship opportunities, an international admissions officer or recruiter, someone within the international office should be able to help and guide you. So I would look at their social media page so you can send them a WhatsApp message if they have it available, or just trying to connect with somebody individually. They should be your go-to person and help you navigate that individual institution because every institution is different, but at least you know someone within those types of roles should be able to help you to navigate through that institution. So just hopefully that will help as well. Now going into personal fit, you know, you, first of course you want to look at the academic program to find out which one do you want or which institutions have academic programs that you're looking for and then helping you to narrow it down further to find that right fit just for you. We added the personal fit just because, you know, we had one student, for example, I, I use this example quite often, that um, he had attended here in Knoxville and when I had asked him, why, why did you choose you know, Tennessee, it's not, you know, typically a known institution or a state outside of the U.S. And he had said when he was researching, he's a mountain biker. He had gone to school in Arizona, so it was between either going to school in Washington or in Tennessee because we have a robust mountain biking system within this region. So that was his reason or rationale in addition to having the academic program that brought him to this region. So those are things that you want to keep in mind what are you passionate about? What's going to keep you um, going with what you're interested in, whether it's mountain biking, for example, or possibly just the nightlife. Is it, are you going to be in a rural area or urban? Do they offer public transportation? Especially when you're looking at some of the rural schools, they may not have public buses or places to get around. You might have to rely on other people or, or get a car to get around especially where the institution might be based and may not be near the convenience of different markets and other kind of malls or um, gathering places. So you want to look at that and to know if that's going to be an important factor. Also, if you like the outdoors, if you're more of the city, West Coast, East Coast, Midwest, and South, the why we mentioned the Midwest and especially even the South is that the cost that we mentioned earlier with value and affordability. East Coast and West Coast are, are typically more expensive in terms of cost of living, um, but also the, within the Midwest, your cost of living is going to be much lower than those areas. And repeating what Ahmed mentioned in regards to the weather, 
if you're used to warmer weather or you want to experience you know snow five six months out of the year you know the u.s is very diverse in terms of weather and climate you can get all sorts of things and keep in mind too that if you're used to warmer weather you may want to find some place like that and then you can travel maybe on different holidays to these other locations to experience snow for for example so doesn't mean that you have to be held down to a region um, because you just wanted to experience snow for, for one moment at, at a time. So they each different school should give you the different temperatures and climates because again, the US is very distinct in terms of climates from the north, south, and the east and the west. And then also just knowing what your personal interests are. And then going into your campus life, something that's very unique to the US education system is I'm gonna point out is Greek life. These are organizations that you can come in, be a member or part of. It's very unique, and I do know that this could be sometimes a factor for students when they're deciding on different schools. So Greek life is not with every institution within the U.S. It's typically your larger schools. They may be a bit smaller at smaller schools, but it's not at all schools. And then, Ackman, do you want to go into the rest of it? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh -huh. again, all this is about your personal fit. Um, so we established that you found your, your program of study that you are looking for. The institution is accredited. Um, it's the cost is comparable to other institutions or um, this is what you can afford. So it's, we, we already checked all the things that must happen, right? So now we, we come to that personal fit, uh, what, what uh, Stephanie already uh, covered. These are important, uh, very important aspects. The campus life can be also a very important uh, aspect. The size of the campus, whether the campus, uh, how safe the, the campus is. Um, so the size of the campus can, can determine the ratio between professors and students, for example, um, which means, stronger student support, um, also that sense of community, the smaller the, more, the campus, the more, um, you know, closer, the closer uh, students get with each other and with the faculty and with the community at large. Um, the campus events that go on in there, whether uh, the campus is diverse, whether it's welcoming and accepting, all these come now can play a significant role in your decision as well. That's given that the main things that you are looking for have been established and several campuses can satisfy that, those options, then you start looking at that personal fit. Safety, Greek life, campus events, size of the campus, uh, location, you know, how, how uh, is this amount, um, like, close to outdoors, like can I go hiking, um, paddle boarding or kayaking or what? Okay, so things that you like. Uh, if you are an active student, then this campus has Greek life, this does not, but um, instead they have a lot, lots and lots of um, student organizations and clubs that you can participate in. Um, do you have the, does this campus offer you the opportunity to even start your own club and organization, have that leadership role? So a lot of, a lot of um, options to consider here. Once you satisfy the must happen, then you can choose based on these. And um, so, yeah, these are different aspects that you need to, 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 to figure out. And an undergraduate degree, from an accredited university or college should have the same weight, generally. Unless it's an Ivy League university, uh, some of the very, very top ones, um, most of the accredited programs and universities and colleges that offer bachelor's degrees in arts or sciences, they will be valued. They will be um, recognized. If you wanted to go to it really what matters is what did you do? How did you, how well you did at that particular university? Uh, again, you could go to one of the 
Ivy League universities, but it is not what um, the environment that will allow you to thrive. You must, you, you, you may be a very smart student, but you needed a certain uh, aspect that's not available there. Uh, maybe a certain learning style that's, that, that this particular institution is not conducive to, then you may go to the, your dream university or college, but struggle. So again, this is one of the things that you need to consider. I need my program of study. I need to be able to excel wherever I am. I need to graduate with a 4.0. Uh, GPA. This will be, I need to do internships, I need to do um, research, I need to um, uh, do extracurricular activities, leadership uh, activities. This is what matters when you graduate, whether you want to find a job or you want to pursue a graduate school. That's what they're going to be looking for. So I just wanted to, <laughs> to add this and I know we are probably running out of time. Um, so this is just a summary of what we did. So we did go over uh, these uh, must-have versus personal fit items or criteria. So when you are looking at a university, then you need to rank your priorities. What is the, your number one um, criterion that must happen? And then you go on to the next one and the next one. So you satisfy the must happen, then you start looking at the optional preferences, desired criteria. So um, now I, I guess we, <laughs> we, we give you examples based on our uh, respective institutions about uh, everything that we, that we talked about. So if you are looking at academics, for example, and you're looking at a Maryville College as uh, your destination, um, again, we offer over 60 uh, programs of study uh, we, that covers the full range of uh, whether it's social sciences, whether it's um, um, uh, STEM fields, uh, pre-professional degrees, uh, unique programs such as um, environmental uh, sustainability and um, Fit Green Happy and uh, Mountain Challenge and, and all this. Uh, we are accredited, regionally accredited, and um, also ranked. So, so uh, I know that we are all guilty of um, trying to add the ranking, to insert the ranking here, even though we say the most important thing is accreditation and the quality of education that that university is giving. But because we know that students and parents uh, also still think about this ranking, so you are going to find us preaching something and then showing still <laughs> that, 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 that ranking is important. So uh, as you can see, we, are, uh, we have been a college of distinction for the past 12 years or 15 years. We have been around since uh, 1819. We celebrated our bicentennial last year. Um, we offer liberal arts education, so it's a broader study. Uh, you learn, you study everything so that you are prepared for anything. Um, again, you are prepared for that next, for the first job, the next job, and a job that hasn't even existed yet. Uh, the size. Uh, we only have 1,200 students, so again, that means uh, smaller class size. So um, again, you're not going to be in a lecture hall with 200, 300 students. Um, the, the ratio between student and faculty would be 12 to 1, which means that professors not only know your name, but they know your dreams, your aspiration, your abilities, how to support you, and so on. The location, and the, this probably we can share with UT. Um, I mean, we are both in Tennessee. We both enjoy the opportunities for um, outdoors activities and the nature, the Smoky Mountains, the, the benefits. Probably the difference here, um, Maryville is a smaller town than the, the Knoxville. So you get to enjoy the best of both worlds. 
uh, worlds, uh, you've got the benefits of a small town where the security, the, the you know, the community, the, this uh, safety, uh, with the proximity to larger cities such as Knoxville, uh, Atlanta is uh, like two and a half hours away, Nashville is uh, the same, um, Florida is like what, nine hours maybe <laughs> drive, but, but all within probably four hour flying anywhere in the States. Um, low cost of living, and this also we share with the University of Tennessee because Tennessee has a lower cost of living. Um, campus life, we don't have Greek life, but we do have over 40 clubs and organizations. Uh, it's a smaller um, uh, campus, but yet diverse. Like you can see, we have uh, students, international students from over 20 uh, different countries. Uh, career preparation is incorporated into the curriculum. So we have a program called Maryville College Works that actually uh, it is required like there are steps that required every year to prepare you for that uh, for uh, life after graduation for careers we um, offer comprehensive we, we require comprehensive exams before you graduate so this uh, is the ultimate you know testimony of your abilities and we also offer you i mean require every graduating senior to do a senior thesis so it's a hands-on research with a faculty member, original research. Um, financial aid, which probably is the most important thing. We offer merit scholarships for every international student who meets our admission requirement. will receive up to a 65% of the tuition fees. Um, the scholarships, the merit scholarships range from $19,000 per year up to $23,000. We also offer competitive scholarships that would cover the full tuition. Um, diversity scholarship is particularly for international students. And in 2018, an, an Egyptian from Alexandria got that um, uh, scholarship. So I'm, I'm so happy <laughs> about that. And I hope to get more students. And I think I'll just move on to the next one, <laughs> give Stephanie the opportunity. Well, I know I'm mindful of your time, but I think, and depending on where you're at with your higher education field or research at the moment, you may or may not have connected with an admissions officer or a recruiter. If you haven't, I highly, highly recommend that you connect with someone at the institution that you're strongly considering, even before you apply, because they will be able to give you all the specifics that we've been discussing. And as we mentioned earlier, there are over 4,000 institutions and each one of them has something unique to say about their institution that might be of interest to you, um, just depending. And for University of Tennessee, we are a research institution. Um, I always recommend, depending on where you're coming from, whether or not you, you wanna be surrounded by other Egyptians or not, it's always good to ask, well, do you have students from Egypt? And if you do, which, is it possible for me to connect with them prior to applying or even enrolling? Um, the admissions officer recruiter can tell you all these great things about the institution, but someone that can help and relate from where you're coming from to know about that transition going there is invaluable. So I would strongly recommend connecting with a student or even a faculty member that might be from your home country that would be able to help tell you, hey, this is something you need to be aware of and I wish they would have told me before we're coming here. But University of Tennessee, we've been around for 225 years, which, wow, um, who would have known? We have a great academic program. We are ranked 46 and we put in there public universities. But when you talk about all institutions within the US, we're ranked 104. So of course, 46 looks better than 104. Mm -hmm. um, but that's still a great number for us to be to be looking at. We're known for our business, our aerospace, our engineering, all within the top 10, if not top five. Our business school is ranked number two within the nation. Um, our aerospace is top notch. We've had seven astronauts. We've had prime ministers. We've had ambassadors. Um, you talk about a great network of alumni to be connected. It's huge. Um, I just talked to our current diplomat in Cairo right now. Um, he's there, he's a UT alum, and he keeps asking, you know, when are we gonna come visit or when can we send things? So there's some place right there um, within Cairo. We also have students that have done short-term programs throughout Egypt. Um, we have students from there. 
Um, Greek life is very popular. Um, goodness, we have scholarships. We have the environment. We have free transportation to get around within our city because our universities located right within the city, but also the Smoky Mountains, which is the number one most visited national um, park within the nation, is right in our backyard. I can look out at it every day. So you have the beauty and the convenience all in one and, and great academic program. So if you are interested, hopefully we'll connect, but whatever school you are interested in, again, please reach out to not first your Education USA officer to find out more about your options and then reach out to your international admissions officers for specific schools. But thank you. I know we have some resources to share. Are you guys uh, still able to see? Because it, it seems like yes. I'm sharing. Okay, great. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> like, oh my goodness, I can, I've not been sharing all this yeah, time. No, no, it's okay. I can see it perfectly well. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks, Walid. You're welcome. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, Walid, if you want to jump in here about to talk about the definitely, you know, the... sure. Thank you guys very much for for the very inf informative uh, presentation. I liked seeing it and I liked hearing you. Thank you so much for that, and thank you for using the format for the uh, presentation as well. It looks it looks it looks perfectly at home. Uh, yes, uh, of course. I mean, we, we, we made sure. We made sure to do that. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> and thank, thank you so for, for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, talk with students. Um, and um, I'm, I was hoping to, to have enough time to answer any questions. I, I have time. and I we, think still, we still do have time. If anyone has okay. any questions regarding um, liberal arts colleges or research universities, if you're looking for certain opportunities, certain types of majors or certain types of scholarships within these balls, please go ahead and ask. Uh, Ahmed has been uh, so kind as to add the um, resources um, slide that we usually have on our uh, presentations, which are available on SlideShare account, uh, which, is, which Ahmed has uh, oh, made us see yeah, as well right now. Thank you. That's it. So it's just all of our presentations are available through that account. We normally update them every few months. So they've been recently renovated. Uh, the account has been recently renovated. So you'll see all of the presentations that we have. And of course, all the resources that are available. Um, of course, you all came from the Facebook account that has all of our monthly events so please make sure to follow up with our facebook page every month by the beginning of every month we add this schedule and to find the links you'll find them on the events section and these are our contact details so feel free to communicate with us uh, the session will be uploaded to youtube the one that you are seeing in front of you Right now, I see a question from Yusuf. Can I join the swimming team without applying for athletic scholarships? For both parties, this is a question for both parties. If, like, if it's different at either of your esteemed institutions, you can let us know. Him. Yeah, it definitely is yeah. different. Athletics. We were talking about about that mm -hmm. right before the presentation. Um, Marable College. I mean, we have divisions, right? Uh, the University of Tennessee is Division One, which means they can offer athletic scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, Maryville College is a Division Three, which means they do not offer. Mm -hmm. I can first you get a chance to do um, what you love to do, like if that, that the sport that you like. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that maybe you can, see, you guys can see us better this okay. way. Let me switch the view over here. Is, is okay. this better? Yep, definitely. Okay. Go so, ahead. so yes, um, uh, definitely, um, you're not going to be joining a team unless, um, you reach out to the coaches and whether it is at the University of Tennessee or at Maryville College or any of the other institutions, they need to see, uh, to kind of interview you, evaluate your abilities, 
and then and see if you are a good fit for the team, you're going to be contributing, then they can allow you to do that. At, at Maribel College, it will allow you to do that for, uh, for the opportunity to express yourself and do the sport that you love, but without any athletic scholarships. At the University of Tennessee, I'm going to let Stephanie talk about right. it. Right. I'm going Brilliant. to. Thank you for the answer. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to repeat everything that Akma had said. I mean, the University of Tennessee is very competitive for sports, whether it's swimming or football, um, American football, for example. They offer very good scholarship packages. Most of the time, the recruiters are probably going to be within your country. Um, scouting for great talent to offer scholarships to come here. Um, if there is a specific area of athletic programs that you're interested in and you are looking for scholarships, we can connect you to a coach, which you would work directly with them regarding a scholarship or not. And then for scholarships or you're just wanting to play without scholarships, I would probably recommend you know, Division II. We're, we're a Division I, Division II, or Division Three, as Ahmed had mentioned. Um, Hopefully that helps. So you can all do that. It's not just um, limited to those who are looking for athletic scholarships. You will have the opportunity once you join in, of course. Right. Another person, Yusr, is asking for any institutions or organizations that provide scholarships like Fulbright. There are many here in the country. You better be concerned with institutions like this in the country where you're at. So you can refer back to the presentation that we've just held a few days ago regarding getting your master's and PhD. You'll find multiple resources that we've added on the presentation. And I can add here the link for SlideShare so you can find this presentation for master's and PhD. You'll find the names of other institutions that offer um, either scholarships for online programs, other institutions that sponsor students for their master's and their PhD, whichever you're looking for. Um, another student is asking. And if I may add, yes. Uh, this is very important, but you know, the scholarships, I know that it is a very important aspect. And that is because um, I'm sure you are, you are all aware of this. Uh, international yep. students are not eligible for um, federal money. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So you, you, you only depend on the institution's offerings of scholarships, whether they're merit, whether they're need based, whether they're competitive. True. But then you can't even get a loan in the United States without a, um, a guarantor, at least. Or a, yeah, a co signer. Mm -hmm. So somebody has to sign the loan with you. But there are other third party entities that do offer scholarships as well. It's, it's kind of a little harder to find, but with the help of Education USA, they can definitely. Uh, sure. That's why it takes time. That's why it takes time. That's why we tell people whenever you're looking to study at the US, just give it like 12 to 18 months before your travel date so you can start the journey of looking through your options, preparing for your tests, and things like that. Definitely. definitely. And there are a lot of scholarships for international students, but you have to look for and they don't have to be significant. They don't have to be in the thousands of dollars. You can find scholarships that will offer $300 scholarship. Fantastic. All you need to do is to apply for it and you can get the books for the semester pay. And so At on. least it's about budgeting. You need to find a budget. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Thank you. I think just to add, Walid, that if they're looking for a postgraduate or a PhD and they're looking for a large amount, there's a lot of teaching assistantships and graduate assistantships that, the, as you had mentioned, take 18 months to 12 months to apply because they do have a long period of review and also the application process for those. But, you know, like a research institution such as UT, we offer most of the time full tuition covered for our postgraduate and okay. PhD programs. But you do have to connect with the faculty member um, you know, find out what they're, they're researching, if they find your background and experiences, you know, applicable to what they're working on, um, they more than likely would try to pull them in to apply to offer, you know, a graduate assistantship or a TA or some sort of scholarship. Yeah. 
Brilliant. We always talk about, about these opportunities, like assistantships and working at the institution itself. Yes. Yeah. Without the graduate teaching assistantship, I wouldn't have been able to graduate. I guess. I guess. <laughs> okay. So you 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 traveled on a on a on a scholarship for being a research assistant. You said I didn't catch. A teaching assistant. Teaching assistant. Yes. Okay. Right. Brilliant. So it it, it was awesome. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Does Tennessee University have? Tennessee Uni has a liberal, liberal arts program for post grad studies majored in social sciences for PhD or post doctoral levels. Okay, we've been talking under the assumption that you all understand that University of Tennessee is 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 not a liberal arts college. It's not a program that is like liberal arts is is a philosophy of a certain institution. So liberal arts colleges do not offer postgraduate degrees, but I'm sure that UT offers, as we were just saying, a lot of options for students looking for financial aid regarding um, like PhDs, MAs, or do you have opportunities for postdoctoral studies, like anybody looking to conduct researches? There, there are some liberal arts universities and colleges that do have graduate degree programs okay. in the master's level. Uh, uh, it's not it's not typical, but they do. Uh, um, uh, so Maryville College, for example, only offers the bachelor's degrees. But we are actually considering our most prominent uh, programs here to start a graduate degree program in there. So really, it it, it depends on the college. Typically not, but but it is it is available. Brilliant. Good to know. Uh, Stephanie, would you like to add anything to that? In terms of liberal arts as a post um, No, in terms of uh, opportunities at the postdoctoral level, if you have any. Yes, oh my goodness. We have well over 50 different postgraduate PhD programs okay. from engineering, computer science, aerospace, architecture, communications, business. We have the number two supply chain management program in the nation. We nice. even have a very unique program called the Tri-Continent Program, which you would be studying in three different countries. You would start first within Knoxville, Tennessee for supply chain management. Mm -hmm. You would do about two, actually one and a half terms here in the US. Then you would move to a partner institution in Germany to work on that program for another about six months, and then you would finish the program in Shanghai with a partner institution there. All the institutions we partner are, are highly ranked. You would get three different degrees. Um, it, it's highly competitive, but they are definitely interested in diversifying the students that are applying for this program. So um, it's, a, again, very unique, very prestigious, but they do want to grow it, and they do want to grow it by having more international students. Lovely. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Okay. Uh, another question, and that's probably uh, one of the most important questions. Like, could you describe the, 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 the liberal arts student, like liberal arts colleges students, what, what are the traits that distinguish a student at a liberal arts college? Entering or graduating? Uh, both, I would say, but we will start with entering because this is this is our main yeah. focus now. I mean, as entering that that like again, admissions criteria will will vary from one university to the next, but we are all looking for academically strong, well, I mean, a person that uh, displayed leadership skills. Um, and community service and like all these, you know, everything that you have been told when you are trying to apply for a university at the, uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking to start with, with somebody who has this um, passion for community building, for leadership skills, for 
thinking, cr critical. I mean, of course, everybody, uh, <laughs> everyone uh, critical who, wants to, who wants to study in the United States, I mean, has um, um, some sort of a vision, uh, want to um, uh, better himself or herself. So we are looking for, for that, but we do more in terms of holistic education, uh, the whole person teaching. Uh, so again, we, we value not just the student to be a passive receiver of information, but more of an interactive person with information to make them into knowledge, to think critically about that knowledge, and to make his, his or her own decision. Excellent. So this way, they have this um, develop this transferable skills. Uh, you know, uh, they could be common sense, they could be critical thinking, they could be, you know, uh, being open to looking at one thing in different, from different aspects. And this is something that I, um, I have to admit, uh, this is something that I learned in the United States, learned to do in the United States. Before I came here, um, my education was based in, in Egypt was mostly memorization, you know, taking the material, you don't have enough time to digest it, you, you know, you get the knowledge and you get it out, but, but here in the United States, and I can speak um, to all of them, all of the institutions, but more in a, in a liberal arts uh, context, it's that you don't take things for granted. You learn to ask the questions, not just the answer to the questions. So Definitely. really, learn to ask the right question to lead a creative, innovative life. I, I, just... I would say also just the ability to entertain different perspectives. Just yes. wanted to add this a bit. Sorry to interrupt you, Stephanie, go ahead. No, 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 Ali. Um, I think just to add as well, I had started at a um, liberal arts private college myself, but the reason for that one was scholarships. I got the most scholarships from that particular institution and also the flexibility of making my career. I think at liberal arts institutions, you're able to develop if you have a desire and a passion to do things. Ahmed had mentioned, you know, start a Greek organization. That's something that I had done, you know, started a Greek organization, did a few other things that helped to build my CV. And that then carried over to other things that I was able to do long term. So it wasn't necessarily, oh, it was a highly ranked school or anything else. It was all the things that I was able to do at a liberal arts institution versus maybe a larger school. Who knows? But we all have different paths. We all have different paths. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We hope that, that it's taught somewhere beneficial, like the US, like we are trying to do. <laughs> Over here. Okay. Any other questions? If we have any other questions, please type them in. Okay. Do you think I should apply for as many scholarships as I can? Would that affect my chances when applying for financial aid? Yeah, I don't definitely. think so. Why? Do it. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. By, by all means. Sometimes I know that that some students, like according to the strength of their application, sometimes the admissions team will assign them certain scholarships because they've proven that they, they possess the qualities that they're looking for. So without applying for other scholarships within the institution, you'll find yourself assigned one automatically because they want yes. to help as much as they can. Yeah, or at yeah. least recommended, recommended another one. Yes. Like for example, they applied for a merit scholarship, but uh, I know that this person showed me samples or of their artwork and stuff. Oh, oh, you you should apply for our full tuition <laughs> scholarship or uh, this competitive scholarship. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Definitely. As long as Probably. you qualify, as long as you meet the criteria for competitive scholarships, you should yeah. apply. Um, of course, it doesn't make sense if you um, do not just play applying for the sake of if applying. You, if you are not really musically inclined and then you apply for the full tuition music scholarship, yeah, <laughs> definitely that's not that's doesn't not work that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It doesn't hurt. 
But I would add, this is why it's so important to connect with the admissions officer or recruiter because they can tell you or, or guide you to certain people to connect with. Um, the more people you connect with, the more doors might open for scholarship opportunities. So apply as many times and as early as you can. Uh, I, and I wanna add just one thing. Um, I said that some institutions allow you to combine scholarships. Uh, but again, a, an institution like Maribel College, we have a cap of how much that some of all these scholarships can be. So the highest, for example, would be $24,000 combining merit and competitive. So you're not gonna go over that. That's if it's merit, unless it is a full tuition scholarship. So mm -hmm. if you earn, if you are awarded that full tuition scholarship, then you can't add anything beyond the tuition. So yeah, the maximum would be the tuition fee, the full okay. tuition fee. Good to know, good to know, definitely. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Galal, for this question, of course. Um, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Stephanie, so much for your presence yeah. today. We look forward to hosting you and your colleagues, of course, um, again and again to conduct as many of these and help as many students as we can. Thank you guys so much again. I know it's uh, about noon where you are right now. Oh, yeah. Is it? Okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> All right. And Heba sends her regards as well. Uh, awesome. Yeah, thank you guys so much. <laughs> and so we welcome. will be in thank communication, you. I'm pretty sure. We will connect yeah, soon again. Yeah, and, and, and please, um, I, I don't know, like if, if your students have any questions, please reach out to us. I think I sent, uh, we sent you guys our contact info and everything. Definitely. So if you, would, if you would share that with, um, with your audience, we will be more than happy to answer any questions that did not come up here. <laughs> That's kind of you. That's kind of you. Thank you, Ahmed. And you, Stephanie, as well. Right. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Good luck. Thank you, everyone. Great. Bye. See you guys on another day. Bye. Thank you. And please say hi to Yasmin for, for us. I will. And hi, Heba. <laughs> I will. I will. Cheers. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.